The sky train rolling in from Vancouver, from Vancouver's sugar plum visions of mountains and sea, glittering towers and gleaming condos, into Surrey, the end of the line. Here they come, the legions of Vancouver's overflow, refugees from the big city's high house prices, from hard winters across the Rockies and harsh lives across the seas. Surrey is not your typically pretty BC picture postcard. Its drearier aspects have made Surrey the butt of jokes in the province. But it's driven by the same dreams of lives of evergreen contentment as its glitzier neighbors. So attractive is the dream that Surrey is growing faster than any of them. Surrey's birthday party. It's first as a full-blown city. Surrey may not be Canada's last frontier, but it is its latest. The birthday baby has serious teething problems, the problems of explosive growth of population. The city has become a place where multiculturalism is daily put to the test, a test whose importance goes far beyond Surrey. In Surrey, the fastest growing segment of the population are South Asians. There are more than 30,000 Sikhs here now. That may be a minority in the community, but here at this high school, the source of Surrey's future, South Asians are the majority. It happened very quickly. Five years ago, almost 90% of the students were white. Their phenomenal growth has put strains on students and staff and on multiculturalism programs. But the young are adaptable. It's been harder for some of their elders. This branch of the Canadian Legion is out of business. Last fall, it put Surrey into the headlines all over the country when it closed its doors to Sikh veterans because they wore turbans. On Remembrance Day, five Sikh veterans were turned away from the hall because they were wearing turbans. They have their own and we have ours. It's as simple as that. serve him, I won't sit with him, I won't speak with him. And what's when you're more, in Canada, you do as the Canadians do. The discords of Surrey are Canada's discords. Multiculturalism's central idea that the celebration of our diversity will somehow bring us together is being increasingly challenged. Many now see it as a barrier that keeps us apart, or at best as a waste of money and effort. Nearly a quarter of a century after it became law, multiculturalism is under siege. A celebration, that's what multiculturalism was mostly when it was started a quarter of a century ago. An affirmation that all Canadians, no matter what their origin, are equal. But the history of multiculturalism and the motivations behind it are more complicated. Pierre Trudeau is the father of multiculturalism. Participation was his thing. Participation of the young, of women, of minorities. Above all, though, multiculturalism was bilingualism's junior sibling. The official designation of a second language is indirectly a support for the cultivation and use of many languages. It is an invitation to explore the delights of many cultures. The linkage with bilingualism raised widespread suspicions that the motive behind multiculturalism was to buy votes and support for biculturalism. Bicultural that suspicion cultural lingers. You know, it was the easy way out uh, to uh, uh, satisfy that particular concern at the time. John Nunziata is a Liberal MP, the son of Italian immigrants, the very kind of Canadian of so-called ethnic origin that multiculturalism was designed to please. Yet he's bitterly opposed. Multiculturalism um, so is a fraud and it continues to be perpetuated on the people of Canada. In my view, multiculturalism uh, 
separates, it segregates, it ghettoizes Canadians of origins other than French or English. It is a distinguishing feature of this country. Distinguishing feature. We don't have many. Bernard Ostry, as a civil servant, was one of the architects of the multiculturalism policy. He disagrees with the critics, both about its outcome and the political motives behind it. I would say the motivations of politicians were very clean in this area. Nikki Basra of Surrey, a child of multiculturalism. She was born when it came into being, and she grew up with it. As she changed over the years, so did multiculturalism. For her, multiculturalism is not so much a policy or a program, it is a way of life. It is the way she looks at herself, how through dancing and in life, she expresses her identity as a South Asian and a Canadian. The costumes may look traditional, but those moves, that rhythm, they're certainly not. That's the beat of hip-hop. It's called Bangla dancing, a combination of the traditional Punjabi folk songs with the funky 90s tempo of the West. I've got two cultures to work with. I can either go totally traditional, I could go totally modern, or I could find somewhere in between. I think so that's where my life is, in the middle, for the both. Living in the middle, living in two worlds. Um, it's very competitive to get into the RCMP. An RCMP recruiting session, RCMP. trying to get a job, trying to become a Mountie, Black. the world of the modern Western woman. That's one world Nikki Basra lives in. And this is her other world, the world of her parents, her role as a devout Sikh. It's an identity she was not always comfortable with. Even turbans and stuff like that, I was just so um, afraid of it. Like I was afraid of how people would react. So I tried to be like them. And I would try to disassociate myself as much as I could walk. I'm not like them, you know. That was when she was younger, growing up in Kamloops, where there was no large cohesive sea community, when at times she was the only South Asian in class. My friends were going to come over and I was like, Mom, you know, why can't you put on something, you know, Canadian? Because my mom, mom doesn't speak English and she's never, she's only worn her Indian clothes. I mean, that's all she's worn all her life and that's all she's ever going to wear. She's never worn pants or dresses or nothing. And I was, it was almost like I was embarrassed of her. Now, it's different. Here in Surrey, like, we have a lot of every culture, so it's okay, you know. Um, it's a lot more accepting here, I'd say. I think we're given more of a chance now to express um, where we're from. Acceptance of ethnic differences, after all, that's what multiculturalism is all about. So how much acceptance is there in Surrey? I have a lot of friends that are Indo-Canadian, Muslim, one of my best friends. They've taught me so much and I love the food. Acceptance, like learning, yes, but with reservations. Jean Ennington has lived here for nearly 40 years, has been involved in local politics and works as a realtor. What bothers her about South Asians, she says, is that too many of them don't pay their fair share of taxes. They use the services, they use the schools, they use the garbage. I mean, I've watched when there's as many as, as 24 milk jugs out in a week. You can tell by the cars parked. I think if you just look and you've got seven or eight cars, that is not a single family home. Illegal suites, that's the problem. Street after street of homes that house several households, but are zoned and taxed as single family houses. It's an issue that has raised widespread resentment. The resentment stems from the fact that you pay your fair share of taxes, somebody else can come into the country and don't have to. I was raised in Canada where we obey our laws. Uh, in, I don't know where, what the kind of law is in, in India or where, anywhere else that they come. It's not just India. Um, 
I was raised that this is our bylaw and don't break it. For her, it's a matter of law enforcement. For others, it's a matter of changing the law to make housing more affordable by allowing smaller lots and more multifamily housing. Lots in Surrey are large, a leftover of its rural past. But empty building lots are big city expensive, $140,000. That, says builder Ragbeer Gurm, forces people into sharing. I, I would say that this is a, uh, a rich, poor issue, really. And, the, and it's the poor that buy these houses. It's the, it's, it's the uh, lower end of the uh, middle class and upper end of the working class that you find in uh, these, these homes. From the outside, they look like the monster homes of rich Asian immigrants that have mushroomed in Vancouver, the mega houses that have Vancouverites cluck clucking in disapproval or ooh-eyeing in envy. But inside, it's different. Inside, you'll find people like Rajendra Gill and his wife Sabjit. They and their three teenage children live in two rooms they rent for $400 a month. They may be living in a fancy-looking new house, but there's still five people crammed into two rooms, the kind of crowded living new immigrants often have had to put up with. Here in the community, he says, my lack of English is no problem. But elsewhere, in stores, on the job, it is. That's why immigrants have always stuck together, to have someone to talk to in their own language. Now, though, the growth of ethnic enclaves is widely seen as an outgrowth of multiculturalism. It encourages, very much so, it encourages to maintain your own cultural background. I think that if you're going to have a country, you should have, you should have main languages, and they should, be, uh, they should learn that. Ghettoizing does not help that. Multiculturalism that, uh, that, ba uh, that uh, focuses basically on your cultural background uh, does not help that, in my opinion. That's Bill Formich. What Bill Formich thinks, what he believes, matters in Surrey. Freedom of the city is hereby bestowed upon William Alexander Formich. Bill Formich. Formich, being honored for a lifetime of service to Surrey, has lived here most of his life and served on Surrey Council for more than 30 years. To Formich, multiculturalism is, first of all, a waste of money. He thinks it was handled better when he was young. There is no such thing as an ethnic group. I don't even remember the word when I was a kid. Basically, everybody talked English, even the, the so-called ethnic people. They, they spoke English, or they tried hard to learn it. Eventually, they learned it, and uh, that's, that's the way it was. But not everyone. Not Formich's grandmother, for instance. When I was 56 years she was here and couldn't speak a word of English. You know, and that's not good. Anna Waken was a Dukabor. More than any other immigrant group, the Dukabors, a Russian religious sect, insisted on keeping to themselves and sticking to the old ways. Extremist Dukabors paraded in the nude and burned down their own houses in their fight to resist the intrusion of Canadian society and authority. To Bill Formich, his Dukobor grandmother is proof of the harm of sticking to one's ethnic roots and worse, of having the government encouraging and subsidizing it. I think she had a poorer life because of the fact that she could not speak English. She was uh, at a, uh, a weaving contest, a festival back in those days. Now that festival was put on by people not by the government, and uh, you had your place to expound your so-called cultural background. And uh, I, I don't think we've really gone, done any real uh, major uh, changes or major uh, help to our community by, by what we've spent the money on. Say multiculturalism 
And this is the picture that comes to mind to most Canadians, spending government money on ethnic dancing and singing and similar pursuits. <laughs> But that's changed. Nikki Bazra and her friends don't get a penny from the government. They sold their own costumes for their performance this summer at Vancouver's PNE, the Pacific National Exhibition. Federal multiculturalism costs $25 million a year, small change by Ottawa standards, and precious little of it is spent on dancing and celebrating. This is where most of the money is spent nowadays, and it's aimed mostly at whites. Year by year, there have been fewer and fewer white faces at Princess Margaret High, and now the school is trying to get them to get used to the new color scheme. You can't deny that there's racism nowadays, especially in high schools. We're just saying that, you know, you got to try and do what you can to stop it and stuff, but nobody really wants to. Like, it's not that they don't want to, they just don't know how to. Are you, would you object if you were called white, pink, magenta? What? School counselor Rick Fabro runs a regular discussion group to try to close the gap of misunderstanding. What does it mean to be a, a white student at Princess Margaret Secondary School? Um, there's like two separate groups, so mostly the Indo-Canadians have their groups, yeah. the um, white Canadians have theirs, and then there's some that intermingle, but it's mainly keep aside, but just a couple intermingling. Well, then, let's go to the question for you. What, what, what does it mean to be a brown student at PM in 1994? When you're East Indian, you can, like, really, like, act East Indian, you know? You don't always have to, like, act like something else. In the community, you kind of have to, like, hide that you're East Indian. You have to act like you're almost like a white person because, like, you're in their society. And you're kind of, like, in your own society. I don't know, I just, like... Oh, well, ever since I've been going to school, it's, I've been a minority, right? Like, kind of classes, like, you need two East Indians and all white. Now it's just a little bit different, it's more easier here. But in the community, right, you look at, I look for a job, I can't find one. I'm not saying it's like a race, I'm just saying it's like just the concept. Like people, they want to hire white people because customers are usually white because it's a majority, right? Uh, I don't know, it's just different out in the community. My friends work at Superstar, right? Mm -hmm. And they're not allowed to keep beards and whatever else, long hair. And he wants to keep a turban and a beard and he's not allowed to. At Superstore? Superstore. Oh, Superstore. Yeah. Right. I, th I think you should be allowed to, right? Why not? It's in our culture. And I understand that's part of your, his culture or whatever, but they have also got to realize that when you're working in certain industries and stuff, there's required uniforms. If you can't meet those required uniforms and stuff, well, what are you supposed to do? That's part of the job. The job is to have certain uniforms, and if you're working with public, they want you to have certain appearances so the public can, you know, be comfortable with you. I'm not saying that it's wrong or it's right, but I'm just saying that's how it is. If uh, the same two people, let's say one white person, one brown person, they have the same everything, I can guarantee that an employer will hire the white person just because the majority of the people that are coming into the store are white and they just, it's just that way. Those feelings have brought on racial friction at the school and the occasional fisticuffs but no deadly violence as in schools in the United States and no fracas over ethnic dress as in France. To Bernard Ostry, that's due largely to multiculturalism. We just have to read what's going on in France with Arab groups or still goes on in the inner cities of the United States. I mean, it's not only because somehow Canadians are nicer I mean, that's baloney. It's because they've made a real effort at dealing with some of these issues while they were ahead of the game. For many years, when Trudeau was right speaking right at the campaign for his leadership at the convention in Ottawa, uh, he was handed the, the note about the murder of Martin Luther King. It is very much part of his mental state as he moved in to 24 Sussex after the election. Austria says Trudeau saw the eruption of black anger in the United States, the whole social revolution that included the Vietnam War protests as a warning of what could hit Canada. Multiculturalism was part of his reaction, an attempt to avoid similar unrest by the disaffected in Canada. 
John Nunciata was a child then. Whatever multiculturalism was then, he believes it's time for change, time for a national debate on multiculturalism. I'm willing to bet my bottom dollar that most Canadians will say, dump it, and let's move on to unhyphenated Canadianism, and let's start promoting uh, what we have in common. But we live in an age when differences prevail over what we have in common, a society of groups insisting on their distinctness and recognition, whether they be Quebecers, Westerners, or Aboriginals, or gays, or women. And the same goes for Nikki Basra, for the Sikhs of Surrey, for ethnic minorities throughout the country. It's not a matter of a hyphen, nor of multicultural policy, but of human rights and dignity. According to press reports, if Nunciata had been born today, his name might not have been John. His immigrant father chose the name to make things easier for his son in what was still a Canada influenced by old British colonial attitudes and pressures to conform. My mother wanted to name me Vincenzo after her late father, but my father felt that uh, it would be easier for me with a name like John. Uh, it would fit. In today's Canada, Vincenzo Nunziata MP would fit just fine. My father's original name was Krzysztofowicz. And Bill Formich probably wouldn't have had his real name taken away from him, something Anglo officials used to do quite casually with ethnic names. It happened when his father landed in hospital after a tree fell on him. And they said, well, what's your name? Because th at that time, you know, names were nothing. And uh, help was very little. So all he could get out of it was Foam, sounded like Fomich, so the doctor wrote down Fomich, and that's what he's been known, was known as, as, as since then. I've thought many times of even put, changing it back, because Krich Tafovich sounds very, you know, it sounds very dignified. The dignity of one's own identity, that's multiculturalism too. Official multiculturalism may be contested, even derided. But the idea of multiculturalism, that to be Canadian, you don't have to conform to some master pattern or try to pass for something that you are not, that idea has been firmly implanted. You can be what you are. You can do your own thing in Canada. All ethics do it even those who never think of themselves as ethnics, and certainly not as hyphenated Canadians. The genteel decorum, the way they're dressed, you'd never confuse them with Italians playing bocce or Frenchmen petanque. No, there's only one ethnic group that would bowl in this weather. To paraphrase Noel Coward, only mad dogs and Englishmen bowl in the midday rain. For primetime news, I'm Joe Schlesinger in Surrey, BC. Nice oh. yeah. oh. <laughs>